The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, the competition of main Soviet tanks, triathlon in the elements, and metal beasts, the British tortoise. It might surprise you to learn that late World War II heavy tanks were far from the heaviest combat machines of the time. Some self-propelled guns had masses exceeding 75 tons. And today, we'd like to tell you about one of them. <laughs> Please welcome the British Tortoise, a super-heavy tank destroyer boasting a battle rating of 6.7. It's armed with a 94 mm gun whose vertical guidance varies between minus 10 and plus 18 degrees, and horizontal one allows the gun to turn 20 degrees both to the left and right sides. The machine is propelled by a 650 horsepower engine, and together with its transmission, it can speed up to a whopping 19 kilometers per hour, both forward and in reverse. The crew includes seven people, the driver, the gunner, the commander, two loaders, and two machine gunners. The ammo stowage is situated on the floor of the combat compartment. The first thing you'd expect from a super heavy machine is indeed strong armor. And strong armor it has. The front of the tortoise can sustain most capped rounds, especially if they come at an angle. With the traverse opportunity of 20 degrees, angling doesn't make aiming too inconvenient. It's also helpful when turning corners. Naturally, the tortoise isn't a great flanking machine, so your only option is to go straight to the center of the map when possible. The best scenario for it is to find a narrow street where your enemy has no opportunity to go round and flank you before you can turn. Moreover, urban environments are also favorable, thanks to another feature of this British machine, its size. The giant hull of this beast can hide a few allies and serve as a mobile bunker of sorts. And if your barrel, transmission, or track become damaged, your allies will prevent the enemy from flanking you while you're fixing it. Anyway, if the situation gets too hot and you can still move, you can always retreat thanks to a pretty high reverse speed and a hefty amount of smokes available. Even after it's destroyed, this machine can affect the battlefield, especially in those narrow streets. Few tanks can move the charred hull of this monster. Hopefully, it'll block an enemy approach, <laughs> not yours. The slow speed and the high mass of this tank destroyer may be seen as an advantage too. It ignores most bumps and thus can shoot on the go with a good level of accuracy. <laughs> Who needs a gun stabilizer if you weigh 80 tons? The T-72 had a hard fate. Now we know that it became the most mass-produced Soviet main tank, with assemblies in eight countries and worldwide fame. But back then, in the late 60s, it was the T-64 that was to become the main tank. Its production had been targeting all tank factories, but the original plans failed. And why would that happen? Let's try to find out. After the end of World War II, the Soviet Union had three tank centers, with Leningrad working on heavies, Kharkov developing the future T-64, and Ural Vagon Zavod in the city of Nizhny Tagil, developing the soon-to-become outdated T-54. Engineer Leonid Kartsev and his team used their experience to create an improved T-55 adapted for the new possible requirement of nuclear war combat capabilities. Another development was the T-62, the first smooth-bore gun tank in the world. The T-54 was already outdated at the time, and with the T-64 still being polished, the T-62 was right on time. Meanwhile, 
the mass production of the T-64 was riddled with issues. The biggest of them was to do with the power plant. The Kharkov engineers had to compromise with the strict size requirements and opted for a compact two-stroke diesel engine with a fanless cooling system. The size limit was met, but the engine was prone to overheating and, expectedly, never showed good reliability. Moreover, it had trouble starting in freezing temperatures and required thorough maintenance. While Kharkov was fixing these issues with the T-64, the Ural Wagonzavod factory was improving their T-62. One day, engineer Kartsev attended the shooting range and had a good look at the T-64's combat compartment. The loader mechanism looked like a good idea with a bad implementation. He noticed that the vertical layout of the ammo stowage got in the way of the driver if he needed to escape. So, the UVZ developed their own autoloader where the rounds were stored horizontally. They didn't stop at it, adding a new high-powered diesel and a six roadwheel chassis. So, when in 1967 it finally got to producing the T-64 on the UVZ premises, the engineers proposed their own ideas for the tank. At first, they thought to simply upgrade the T-64. But after some tests, creating a new model seemed a better idea. And that's how the familiar T-72 was born. Comparison testing proved that installing a regular diesel was the right idea. With the capability of running anywhere in the huge country, be it in the north or the far east, the T-72 had become the main battle tank of the Soviet army for decades. Today's triathlon will feature unusual boats, those that almost fly over the water rather than glide. Please welcome the American PGH-2, the German VS-10, the Japanese PG-02, and the Spaviero from Italia. We love to invite the Soviet Project 206M here and see its weaponry in action, of course. Well, the first stage, we'll see these four compete for speed. They will have to reach a rock, go around it, and make it back. Crews are ready. Let's go! Our boats speed up and rise higher above the water surface. The German crew takes the lead right away. Then we see the Japanese, the Italian, and the American ones grouped pretty tightly. No change of position is seen before they turn. The German boat is already heading back, increasing the gap even further. And done. The second to finish is the Japanese one, then the Italian, and finally the American boat. Next stage, we'll have our vessel successfully hit two naval targets. Let it be the British Brave torpedo boats. One of the targets can be hit with a torpedo. The guns are loaded. Open fire! The German boat sends some torpedoes at the first target and quickly switches to the second one. Meanwhile, the Italian crew is <laughs> already done. Those boats could not survive even a handful of 76mm HE rounds. The Japanese boat has a smaller caliber, but a good rate of fire doesn't take long for everyone to finish that stage. Finally, the last part. Here, we'll check the anti-air capabilities of the boat. We'll send two targets. A bomber at two kilometers altitude, say an Il-4, and a torpedo bomber imitating an attack, say a hell diver. The crews are searching the skies. Enemy plane spotted! The Japanese and the Italian boat's radar give the enemy away. They all quickly finish off the torpedo bomber and aim for the second target. The Italian crew is the first to destroy the bomber and thus finish the leg. All thanks to an accurate gun and proximity fuse HE rounds. The Japanese crew, however, took longer. Its 20mm gun 
loses a lot of impact at longer distances. The US and German competitors had no trouble with the torpedo bomber, although they had to search for it the old way. The bomber, however, well, the American boat couldn't hit it without an auxiliary leading marker, while the German 15mm gun simply didn't do much at that distance. Let's sum up. The bronze goes to the German VS-10 for the best speed and the two torpedoes. The silver goes to the PG-02 for its radar, good mobility and high rate of fire. And the winner today is… the Italian boat. Great dynamics, a good gun, proximity fuse rounds. That's a well-balanced boat for all intents and purposes. Well, time to give the crews some shore leave. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Well GG Bro. How to play with M1A2? Hi there. Well, all top MBTs are pretty balanced machines. They don't differ much, and the only things that the Abrams can boast in its class is the highest turret turn speed, which means it's the king of the urban skirmishes where the enemy might spring out from any direction. Emmanuel Hortland asks, If an aircraft has two pilots and you shoot one of them, can you still fly the same as though you had two alive? Hello Emmanuel, if one of the pilots becomes incapacitated, the plane will fly on without losing any flight performance. Another question comes from Asashi Reiko. Are there any plans for adding more or updating top tier ground forces for Japan? Hi Asashi! Actually, the Type 90 had its reload speed updated only recently. It can now send a new round at the enemy every 4 seconds, no matter what level its crew is. The change has had an impact on the whole game process. So, if you haven't used this machine in a while, you might find it refreshing now. Alexander Zaitsev writes, Which tank? has the longest gun in the game. Hi there. The longest gun barrel belongs to the Soviet Object 120 tank destroyer with a whopping 9 meters. If you need a comparison, it's a little shorter than the mouse tank. And the last comment for today was written by Maciek AHA. Fastest plane or slowest missile? What should win? Hi there. We've already done this test before in episode 186, so rest assured, the fastest plane can easily outfly the slowest missile. Well, once more, it's that time again, so that's all for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 pm GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe, that's the big sign, and click the bell. The noisy one. N not if, but because you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to fuel your tanks and boats. Never mind vodka. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments with us, and we'll see you next week. Bye.